Today, uh, we have the talk by David Casagrande about floods and policies. Uh, so I'm going to introduce now David uh, and also say thank you to David because a lot of the uh, programs that we uh, launched in the last year uh, have been uh, co-creation together with David, thinking who are the speakers that we want to bring in. Um, and uh, thank you, David, for supporting uh, us in that way, too. Uh, so, uh, so David, uh, David is a professor of anthropology and director of environmental initiatives at Lea University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Um, he has studied relationships between human culture and natural environments in Mexico, Venezuela, and the United States with an emphasis on policy and planning. He worked as a policy analyst in state and local government for 10 years. Uh, his research areas have included how Zelal Maya, uh, and excuse me for my pronunciation, <laughs> use uh, medicinal plants, this is the uh, decisions about water in the American Southwest, uh, response to flooding and climate change, and impacts of uh, extractive technologies like hydraulic uh, factoring for natural gas. Uh, he currently collaborates in US and international teams studying decisions to relocate in response to disasters and climate change. Uh, his work has appeared in journals like Environmental Management, environment, environment and Behavior, Human Organization, Society and Natural Resources, and Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment. Uh, from 1999 to 2003, he was Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Ecological Anthropology, his research has been supported by National Science Foundation, National Sea Grant Program, the Japan Foundation, and other sources. So uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, and uh, after the talk, we're going to have an opportunity for you to all ask questions. So uh, please use the Q&A uh, button to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Boaz, for that introduction. Uh, and so I, I think people can Type in Q&A at any time throughout uh, th while I'm talking, but we'll save the questions for the end, but you can type a question anytime you want uh, and we'll get to them uh, at the end. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here uh, talking about a subject that I think is extremely important and underappreciated. Uh, and it is basically how we as a, a country are going to respond to um, the increasing threat of flooding uh, as a result of climate change. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is just give a brief overview of the problem, climate change, and how many people are going to have to relocate, perhaps, and, and that type of thing. Then I'll talk a little bit about the current policy context for addressing increasing flooding. And then I'll talk about my my own research within, within that uh, space. I'll go a little bit light on the research methods uh, and a little bit uh, heavier on, on the implications of the research findings. So we know uh, there's a pretty good consensus in the literature that with climate change, we will see increased storm intensity and rainfall because there's going to be more moisture uh, in the atmosphere. It's still a little debatable whether there'll be more hurricanes or more tornadoes, but for sure the storms are becoming more intense uh, and carrying a lot more rainfall, uh, which is going to lead to more flooding. Uh, and uh, that includes inland flooding, rivers, uh, and I've done a lot of work along the Mississippi floodplains and also coastal flooding, storm surges from hurricanes, uh, that type of uh, damage. And so here's just a few quotes from the literature uh, in the Mississippi watershed. Uh, climate change is definitely been linked with an increase in flooding over the last hundred years. This is uh, citing a paper from a colleague I work with, Nicholas Pinter. Uh, at UC Davis. Uh, we've worked on several projects together, uh, but also coastal areas. And there is a particular concern about two areas. One is the uh, eastern shore of Maryland, um, the Chesapeake Bay area, uh, and also Louisiana. And, and I'll explain why uh, those are real hot spots a, a little bit later, but we are anticipating uh, significantly more flooding uh, in those two areas. And those are the two areas that I've focused my research on primarily over the last 15 years. <clears throat> so as the climate changes and sea level rises and storms become more intense, what will the impact be on people? 
uh, and some some people have run some academics have crunched the numbers and there are an awful lot of people who are going to have to move uh, over the next um, 30 years or so I'm sorry 70 years or so uh, around the world uh, and in particular there was some there's some really good work uh, that's been done uh, by somebody named Hauer uh, I believe he's at the Uni University of Houston at now um, he was at Georgia I believe when he did a lot of this work but he's moved on uh, and he's actually run some models about uh, where the sea level rises and 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 whether it's going to be one foot, two foot, or three foot, uh, how many people would be impacted. But he's a demographer, and he's done something very interesting. He's actually modeled where these people are likely to go based on past migration uh, patterns. And so um, if you're interested to know uh, what cities might be receiving people, uh, some surprises in there, uh, places like Duluth. Uh, are expecting um, to actually receive a, a lot of people. It's obvious people are going to be leaving places like Miami, but where are they going to go? Uh, he's done a really good job of at least starting a conversation about where people will be leaving and where people will be going uh, in America uh, in particular. He's got a series of publications. So how are we responding to this? And people are starting to move, uh, especially after Hurricane Sandy. Uh, a lot of people left Staten Island area, uh, and uh, surprisingly enough, uh, some of them relocated to eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, but uh, there, there, there is a migration beginning. We we can start to see that showing up in in data. What is the government response to this? Uh, so far, uh, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, is mostly responsible for relocation problems uh, programs. I'll get into a lot more detail about that in just just a minute. Uh, they've rel relocated about 40,000 people through voluntary buyout programs, which I'll talk about uh, more. Uh, and yet, um, billions have been spent on these stru structural mitigations, like building seawalls, flood walls, and all this other kind of stuff. So clearly, the priority so far has been to fortify uh, rather than relocate. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, our, our, our propensity <laughs> uh, to engage in structural bias a, a little bit more. Keenan has done some really interesting work also, uh, and looking at mortgages in particular. And this is, I think, he's done a particularly good job of of highlighting the program, uh, the problem uh, from from current uh, programs. And so, so basically, uh, a lot of if you have a mortgage in the United States, uh, you're required to have flood insurance if you're in a flood zone. Uh, and so. Um, what he's done is he's crunched some numbers uh, and found out that there are a lot of people who are um, living in areas that will be uh, flooded up to um, a, a foot of sea level. And, and at that point, uh, there's going to be a, an awful, there'll be a very large uh, concentration of risk uh, that's being taken on by American taxpayers through the National Flood Insurance Program, which I'm going to describe uh, in, in some detail in just a, a minute. So the National Flood Insurance Program is the primary policy tool we have for dealing with flood risk uh, in the United States. It was uh, created in 1968. Uh, and what happened in 1968 was there were a lot of floods, uh, inland floods, uh, especially in the Midwest. Uh, and at that point, there was just private flood insurance in the market. And most private insurers uh, realized that they didn't want to really uh, be taking on that risk. It was too hard to evaluate the risk. And that would lead to, and when they could evaluate it, it was leading to premiums that were so high, no one could afford to buy them. And so they essentially just left the market uh, and left a, a, a large swaths of the, of, the, of the vulnerable population without any access to flood insurance. So Congress passed a law, the National Flood Insurance, uh, and that created the National Flood Insurance Program uh, that said essentially the federal government would sell flood insurance to people at a discounted rate in exchange for local communities to participate in flood mitigation planning. Uh, and so in order to buy flood insurance from the federal government, uh, you have to belong to a community that is in the National Flood Insurance Program. That can be a city, a county, whatever the, the local jurisdiction is. And um, so these communities have to enforce regulations like you 
cannot build house under uh, or a structure under a certain elevation, or you have to elevate the, the in, in, on stilts and stuff. You've probably seen some of these pictures of elevated buildings, uh, things like that. You have to have an evacuation plan. And so the idea was to use the flood insurance discounts as an incentive to reduce the risk of flooding in communities. Uh, and it's been more successful in some states than others uh, because it is up to the states to actually enforce uh, the regulations. And um, I've worked a lot of, in Illinois and they've been particularly effective uh, at um, reducing risk using the National Flood Insurance Program by enforcing strictly the regulations on, on communities. So this is going along fine until 2005 uh, when we had a series of very large storms that eventually the bill, um, the insurance claims were so much that it, it exceeded the ability of the National Flood Insurance Program to cover all of the claims. Uh, and so these storms, uh, Hurricane Katrina, Superstorm Sandy, uh, came um, almost back to back. Uh, and the program went from being financially sound uh, in up to 2005 to being continually in deficit since then. Uh, and so this is sort of the financial manifestation of climate change when we're talking about storms being more severe, having more rainfall. Uh, and we can see that in the destruction that's happening. Yes, there's more um, development in floodplain areas, and that's part of it too. But also, we can we can um, climate modelers can figure out how much is also from climate change. So uh, it threw the the program into deficit, uh, and that deficit has increased steadily since 2005. It's currently at 25 billion uh, the deficit, uh, and that's only because um, the uh, Congress. Uh, passed a bill in in two uh, right after 2017 that essentially bailed out the program to the tune of about uh, 16 billion dollars, and so brought it back down to 20 and a half billion. But now it's back up by another five billion because we just keep getting more and more rain, more and more of these intense storms, uh, which is leading to uh, more and more insurance claims. Uh, and so this is again the primary policy tool we have for managing flood risk in the United States is the National Flood Insurance Program. And the fact that it's $20 billion in debt, probably, you know, really $37 billion in debt, uh, <clears throat> is, is a clear indication that the, the bill for climate change is starting to arrive. Uh, it's rather large. Uh, and please note that I'm just talking about flooding. I'm not even addressing wildfires uh, and a lot of the other uh, droughts and a lot of the other effects of, of climate change. So these are things we're going to have to deal with. So I'm working in an area, uh, something called managed retreat, uh, and that is defined as a coordinated effort uh, to permanently move people and assets away from hazardous places. Uh, and the key here is coordinated efforts. Uh, so we can plan like municipal planners, uh, county planners, uh, how we want to manage uh, in, a, in an organized way, in an equitable way, uh, the relocation of people over time as these hazards continue to increase, as opposed to just letting things play out as they would, uh, which can lead to uncoordinated, chaotic, and uh, I won't have much time to talk about this, mostly inequitable response to climate change, because some people are going to be able to afford to leave and some people aren't. Uh, and so when you're just thrown into a chaotic market, uh, those people who are disadvantaged will have a more difficult time uh, dealing with this. And so one idea of managed retreat is to, to spread out the equity uh, a little bit. Uh, and so these definitions and, and, and these three bullets are actually from a publication uh, I put out with some of my colleagues uh, um, in a current, imper uh, current Opinion and Environmental Sustainability. Uh, and in that article in particular, we're, we were arguing that this isn't just about managing risk. It's, it's actually an admonition that we have to work with nature rather than continually trying to fight against nature, which really kind of changes our worldview and how we see our place um, in, in nature and in the world and our relationship with nature. And so there's a huge potential here if we do this carefully and thoughtfully to actually lead to some more societal transformation and move us along a path towards sustainability. But first we have to admit, we cannot build our way out of this problem 
Some people are going to have to make very difficult decisions about relocating. So why would we want to, as a policy uh, entity, the government uh, and so on, actually spend money on this? And it's not going to be cheap. Uh, there are there, so the rationale is first of all uh, we're paying a lot for insurance. You saw that bill, and so uh, it will um, reduce that that risk, uh, the financial risk associated with flood insurance. The most important reason is people are going to get hurt if they're living in these dangerous areas, and so it's probably from a moral standpoint a good idea to encourage them to leave. A lot of these people actually want to leave and can't. Uh, which is uh, something I'll talk about from the research uh, in a little bit. Uh, but um, first of all, is to reduce potential loss of, of life uh, and, and, in, and injury. And a lot of things that people don't realize, I've interviewed a lot of emergency management agents, including the director of the Illinois uh, Emergency Management Agency. Uh, and you know, somebody has to make a decision about going in to rescue people who are living in, in some of these areas. And these are very difficult decisions. Do you want to uh, put you, the lives of your emergency response personnel at risk uh, more and more and more as climate change makes things more and more dangerous? Uh, and so this is, I think, uh, something that's a bit underappreciated, uh, that uh, there's a lot of times rescue workers just can't get um, to places to, to rescue people especially during hurricanes and so on. Uh, and then, of course, a big reason is to address this flood insurance issue that I've outlined previously. Uh, something that um, you might not think about is, because right now coastal properties are selling, the prices are going up, uh, but there's a pretty serious conversation going on in the reinsurance industry about how long it can be sustainable. Uh, and at some point, uh, there's going to you're going to see prices start to go down, especially um, if insurance premiums do have to go up, uh, and there could be a very rapid uh, exodus of capital from coastal real estate markets. Something called climate panic. Uh, some ecology, I'm sorry, some economists are talking about. Uh, and in our research, we interviewed realtors in Chesapeake, and they're starting to see some evidence of prices going down. But there's these things kind of work with tipping points all of a sudden there'll be a massive loss of equity uh, in the real estate market. It's probably better to avoid that because massive loss of equity in sectors of our economy can lead to recessions and depressions. Uh, and so um, this is something we have to try to avoid through public policy. And also, this is something that can be used to correct social inequalities uh, of the past. And I'll, I'll get to a few examples uh, in just a minute. It's not appropriate everywhere. Uh, it is appropriate in areas. It's not appropriate in some place like Manhattan <laughs> in New York. You're not going to move the city of Manhattan. But in Manhattan, the real estate is worth so much that these structural uh, solutions like building flood walls and pumps and all this other kind of stuff meet a benefit cost analysis. Uh, so the amount of money you would spend on infrastructure to protect, protect Manhattan um, is is far outweighed by the amount of, of real estate you're protecting. But what about other parts of the country where people are a bit more spread out, the real estate might not uh, be worth so much? Um, these places often don't meet cost-benefit analyses, and so the Army Corps of Engineers might not put a project in a place where there's not enough real, uh, not enough value in the real estate. Uh, and so managed retreat is more um, Applicable, applicable or appropriate in some of these places where infrastructural solutions are not technically feasible or don't meet uh, benefit cost analyses. So it's just a tool in a policy portfolio. So what are we actually trying to do? To, let me make very clear, there is no legislation <laughs> in place to deal with managed retreat. Uh, and uh, there's the, the, the attempts to introduce legislation are, are, are pretty um, stunted. Uh, but in, President Obama was the first one to kind of take this uh, seriously, and he um, issued an executive order uh, directing all federal agencies to start thinking about it, essentially, and start coordinating uh, and, and planning for the reality that this is something uh, that we might have to deal with. <clears throat> and then I'll come uh, uh, skip ahead to, to President Biden in, in a few more slides. So Right now, the primary tool we have for managed retreat is uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency FEMA voluntary buyouts. And I'll 
talk more in, in detail about those in just a second. Uh, and so the, these are uh, buyouts where you actually buy out a, ho a home uh, and um, the federal government buys the home and, the, and pays to relocate the people. Uh, and this can be um, bundled with some other sources of federal funding or private funding to actually move entire communities, entire towns. And I'll give an example of Valmire, Illinois, um, in a few slides. But there's no dedicated comprehensive legislation for relocating entire communities. There are a few pilot programs that have recently been um, initiated, but there's no legislation that would help entire communities relocate if they want to. And I'll make an argument for my research about why relocating entire communities is better than just individual homes. So it does, if you're gonna relocate an entire town, um, it does require more funding than would be required just to relocate the homes. If you're building a new town, you have to put in infrastructure like roads, water treatment, sewage, all of these other kinds of things. So this is something, this is an idea that far exceeds the, the, the funding that would be available just from FEMA uh, home, individual home buyouts. Valmeyer, Illinois, and I've worked a lot there. I, I, I'm actually fairly good friends with the, with the mayor who are, um, orchestrated this uh, relocation after the 1993 floods, Dennis Knobloch. Uh, and, and they're sort of the poster child of doing this. It was a town of about 800 people. It was white. There were huge floods along the Mississippi uh, in 1993. And they as a community decided to relocate the entire town to higher ground. A few people did not go. There's always a few people who stayed behind uh, and they still live in the floodplain, but they built a new town essentially and tore down the old town. Uh, and so they financed most of the individual home relocations with these FEMA buyouts, but then they had to cobble together all of these other funding sources from HUD, uh, community block grants, private investments in development, uh, and so on to actually build a new town. This was incredibly difficult for Dennis Knobloch to pull together, and there's very few people that have been able to pull it off. And we are arguing that there should be government programs that would sort of bundle all of this together for people like Dennis Knobloch who are attempting to relocate an entire town out of, out of, a, out of the way of a hazard. A more recent case uh, is a town called Ile de Jeune Charles. Sorry, I speak Spanish, not French. Uh, but they are uh, relocating this town on the Louisiana coast. Uh, and um, it's very expensive. It's about $54 million to, to relocate about a, a town that has only about 60 homes. Uh, but this is the first time there was actually um, HUD, uh, Housing and Urban Development, uh, put together a package for the community to actually relocate the community that's ongoing right now. Uh, they're still in the process of building and planning the new community and so on. So just to bring us up to, to, to date, um, in November, this past November, uh, the Biden um, uh, administration actually announced a, a, a new a voluntary community-driven relocation program led by the Department of Interior to help tribal communities relocate. And again, this is this idea of, of the social justice aspect of this. Uh, a lot of tribal communities have been under-resourced uh, and of course, um, some people argue we stole all the land from them to begin with. Uh, and so uh, here's, an, here's an attempt to actually uh, redress uh, some of those historical injustices by helping them relocate uh, in response to climate change. So the Biden administration is very big uh, on trying to spread these issues of social justice throughout a, a lot of programs. And this is a really good example. So how... In order to understand my research, I'm going to describe a little bit about how the voluntary program actually works. So say there's a flood uh, or there's an area that's uh, likely to flood a lot. Um, individually, individual property owners are pooled into a, an application that's submitted by the local government, whether it's a municipality or if it's unincorporated, a county government. Uh, and the so the municipality if it's a city council or if it's a county and there's county commissioners, they have to vote to approve this package. And it's basically meaning that a lot of people who, if they 
take this buyout and they move to another town, this town is losing tax base. And so uh, a lot of times the, like the county commission or the city council might actually vote down uh, this uh, 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 a package like this. And so it's it's the program is trying to strike a balance between individual needs and, and community uh, decisions. Uh, so, and of course, whether the federal government is gonna pay for this or not is based on a benefit cost determination, whether or not there's a certain amount of uh, reduction in, in damage that would be paid for by flood insurance that can be avoided by paying for relocation. So the federal funds are actually used to purchase a house at pre-disaster prices, the fair market value. The federal government removes the structure, pays uh, the people's expenses to relocate. They can buy a new house uh, with the money that they got for the old house. And this is a problem because if the old house wasn't worth much, they might not be able to afford to do this, uh, which is an issue of equity. Uh, and then that property can never be built on again. So the idea is with this program is you get people out of these floodplains so that you reduce the flood risk by having people relocate. Now, what happens to that property that's now vacant is it has to be turned over to that local government. And this is another reason why local governments might not want to do this. Because if you don't have everybody do it, say it's just one house here, one house there, and it's a patchwork, now the city or the county is stuck with a bunch of empty lots that they have to mow and take care of and all this other kind of stuff. So they've lost tax base and uh, they've accrued this, this extra burden. So what they like to do is get a package where a whole bunch of contiguous properties are bought out. So now you have a nice open space where you can put things like ball fields or a park or something that doesn't have structures on it and can flood. Uh, so we see most of the most successful programs uh, are actually, you know, the properties are turned into some valuable public space and it can never be developed again. Okay. Most people don't want to do this. And some of the people I've been working with, we've developed this concept of what we call the structural bias, which is when floods are happening, things are getting bad. The first thing people want is not to have to make difficult decisions like relocating. They want the government to build some sort of protective structure. Uh, this is a picture I took uh, during a flood in 2013 in Cape Girardeau. Uh, and um, that's actually in Missouri. And so uh, and you can see from this flood, very, very, this picture very well, but there's a wall that's actually holding the Mississippi. The Mississippi River right now is about 12 feet higher than the city street. <laughs> that's in the other part of the photo. Uh, and uh, it's kind of scary. You hope that 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 wall holds or the whole uh, downtown gets flooded. Uh, but that's an, uh, that's an example of what Cape Girardeau preferred rather than relocate. <clears throat> so the, most of the research I've been doing over the last 15 years has been looking at what are the impediments uh, to relocation? Uh, what is it that best predicts whether people want to relocate or not? What are some of the social processes that are involved with people actually forming attitudes uh, about relocating and what is the, the, the risk that's involved uh, with, with staying? Uh, and how are people's public, how, how are the public perceptions different from from policymakers, in particular local people like emergency management agents. Uh, our work is based uh, on some, some theory, in particular an anthropologist named uh, um, Mary Douglas, uh, who talked a lot about how people's perceptions of risk, we don't really pay attention to the things that are most dangerous. The most dangerous thing you can do right now or today is probably you know, get in your car and drive home. That's really dangerous. We don't think about it. Uh, taking a shower is actually really dangerous. A lot of people slip in you know, bathtubs and stuff. We don't really think about this. But yet we're you know, obsessed with terrorism and, and all these other things, which are extremely likely to unlikely uh, to affect any of us on an individual basis. And so she started really the whole field of risk analysis, uh, thinking about this idea that risk is actually our perceptions of risk are a cultural constructive construction and they're they're culturally relative uh, and people selectively choose uh, what they'll be um afraid of uh, based on their own moral values and the groups of people that they belong to uh, and um, we have a social psychologist here don packer who does a lot of work on this and what you choose to be afraid of 
actually helps define the boundaries of the groups that people belong to. Uh, and so this was rather um, influential in the, in the 1980s and continues to be. The other uh, theory I work a lot with is cognitive dissonance, which is this idea that if you have one, if you have two or more conflicting logics or thoughts or behaviors uh, in your head, it creates psychological discomfort and you have to deal uh, with that in some way. You have to reduce that cognitive dissonance either by changing your behavior or, and this is something that has really been ignored in the literature a lot. Some people will not change their behavior. Instead, they will try to convince other people of their point of view in order to reduce their cognitive dissonance. And thousands of experiments have been done on people changing a thought or behavior. Very little work has been done on this idea that Festinger was writing about, which is that people will try to convince other people to their attitudes uh, and beliefs in order to reduce cognitive dissonance. I bring this up because it actually becomes important when we're thinking about public policy and how we can look at some of the gaps between the public and uh, policy perspectives on risk. So, <clears throat> I've done a lot of work in the in the middle of Mississippi, Illinois, Iowa, Missouri floodplains. I won't go into this in, in much detail other than to, to, to let you know that what we do is we combine actual real modeling of what the risk is based on hydrological models. Um, this is what I do with my colleague, Nicholas Pinter. Uh, he's a hydrogeologist. Um, we did a, a lot of interviews, uh, participant observations. I've actually been out like sandbagging levees while the floods are coming to see how people are thinking about this. I'll talk mostly here about a survey we did uh, where we surveyed um, 500 households in rural parts of, of the Mississippi floodplain to try to understand uh, what, um, tr tr what what's informing people's perceptions of risk. So when we look at the interview data, it was, it was, it, it's interesting, you know, you can be interviewed, people say, well, is this, risky to live here because, you know, there's a lot of floods, uh, and they'll say, yes, uh, maybe uh, it is. I had a very, very interesting experience uh, with, with a woman I was interviewing in rural Illinois, uh, and she was telling me this story about how one time the levee broke, the town had flooded, and while it was flooded, a tornado came through and took out whatever was left standing. And I asked her, I said, do you consider this a risky place to live. And she said, oh no, it's not as bad as someplace like California where they have earthquakes and mudslides and all this other kind of stuff. Um, and it's interesting, psychologists call this social comparison. You, are, you, you, you There's always somebody who, who, who has it worse, uh, which got me to thinking, well, how bad does it actually have to be for someone to admit that they're living in a really dangerous place? Uh, and here's where I can't see if people are laughing or not. But geez, do there actually have to be sharks in the tornado while the town is flooding for people to admit they live in a dangerous place uh, or not? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but <clears throat> clearly, people tend to downplay the, the risk if they don't want to do things like threaten their quality of life, their sense of community, or their sense of place. And this is something that came out in a lot of uh, discursive themes um, was this idea that people, uh, when they were thinking about the risk, we're really thinking about community integrity and what it's like to live uh, where they live. And um, they talked a lot about institutions. Now, these are small rural towns in the Midwest, and the school means everything, the church means everything, these local institutions. And if those institutions are threatened, that's when they really start to take the risk uh, seriously. Um, and they said a lot, you know, people who, who, take, who might take these buyouts are actually abandoning their community. I have many, many vignettes of, of people talking about that. I, I should say that the buyout process is very slow, uh, and this is a big impediment to people taking a buyouts and relocating. They just can't wait. They start to rebuild their house where it is. The, actually, the risk to life is, is not something that people really talk about. They think they have enough time to escape. Um, we, we hear this also with hurricanes. And so they're more worried about these other things like impact to the integrity of the community. Uh, financial risk is very important. Uh, people do worry about the equity in their home. They worry about flood insurance. And uh, the go local governments are just really worried about losing tax base. And so how will flooding affects, affect tax base is, is a dominant theme. <clears throat> this really came to a head with a law that was passed in 2012 called the Bigger Waters Act, uh, in which 
they were attempting to deal with this huge deficit in the national flood insurance program I was talking to you about, the $25 billion deficit. Uh, and so Congress said, look, we just can't keep running this deficit. So in 2012, uh, they passed a law that basically said all the subsidies were going to be removed and the national flood insurance program oh, phased in over a five-year window would start charging premiums that were based on the real risk, actuarial premiums. Uh, and so they started going out and having community meetings and all of this other kind of stuff. And some of the numbers started to emerge. And I talked to people who had a house that might've been worth $100,000 and they currently pay $2,000 a year for flood insurance. And under bigger waters, their insurance premium could go as high as $20,000 a year. So can you imagine who in a $100,000 house is going to be able to pay $20,000 a year for flood insurance? Who is going to buy a house that's worth $100,000 that they have to pay $20,000 of flood insurance on? And remember, I don't know if I made it clear before, but if you have a federally backed mortgage and you're in a floodplain, you are required by law to have flood insurance. These houses would essentially become worthless. The people could not afford to live there and pay that if they have a mortgage and nobody would buy it. So quickly, it's, it's a really a policy fiasco because nobody, I guess, really crunched the numbers. I don't guess, nobody crunched the numbers. Uh, and when it started coming out, there was massive public backlash. And then there was a, a law passed in 2014 that repealed most of, of, of these uh, premium phase-ins and brought us kind of back to where we were or kicked it 15 years down the road. This is an interesting moment in this policy space because it revealed what is the true risk of living in these floodplains. And a lot of homeowners got it. They're like, oh, my risk is not $2,000. My risk is $20,000. I have to start thinking about how to get out of here. And it's only when that became apparent did they really start thinking about relocation. They weren't thinking about if they could die in a flood. They were worried that their house would become worthless. So we know that buying individual homes can erode the tax base. Uh, and um, a, a lot of people are, are um, worried about the community, other people abandoning them and so on. A lot of communities want to avoid, these are small rural communities in particular, people just moving everywhere in the community disappearing, they'd like to relocate together and keep their church and keep their school. Uh, so they want to avoid this diaspora effect. Valmeyer was successful. It maintained the population and the population is actually bigger now than it was in 1993. Property values are higher than they were in 1993. They have nicer new houses and subdivisions uh, and so on. And most of the people were satisfied. We went back and we did focus groups uh, with the people who re relocated and they said, Every time they look at the news and it's going to flood and they're high up on that hill, they are just so happy they did it. Uh, and so this is an example, like I said, of a success story. <clears throat> there are other towns in the in the Mississippi uh, watershed uh, that also relocated, but Valmeyer is kind of one of the best examples of success. Relocating entire communities is more likely to be successful uh, because you can maintain your institutions, community identity, and so on. Uh, and people are more likely to do it if they're going as an entire community than just individuals abandoning their community. But first, we have to come, overcome this idea that there's a structural solution. And in Valmeyer, this is really important. It was clear that the Army Corps of Engineers was not gonna save this town with any kind of levy construction. And once that was made clear, there was no structural solution. After that, uh, the town got serious about relocation. So just, I'm gonna quickly go over some, some, some uh, survey results because I do wanna get onto the case about the Chesapeake, which is quite different. Um, so most people are, in the, who live <laughs> along the Mississippi River are uh, in line with, with the scientific findings that it is flooding more frequently. There's absolutely no doubt about it. And people realize that. They responded in the survey that, yes, that's, um, that's, that's a problem. 
Only 39% of people who said they're likely to flood actually had flood insurance. Uh, and I bet almost all, well, I don't know, that most, almost all 39%, almost all the people in that 39% were required to have uh, flood insurance because they had a mortgage. Most other people, if they're not required, don't have it. Uh, and um, this is very interesting. Almost half the people we surveyed said they wouldn't be able to afford to sell their home and leave if they wanted to. And so again, this gets to this issue. These are rural communities where people don't have a lot of money and managed retreat is a way uh, to sort of deal with the fact that these people are sort of locked into a situation. They can't get at it and they're at risk. Uh, and uh, it's something that we have to keep paying for again and again when these disasters keep hitting these communities. 62% were willing to, or very willing to accept a future buyout for insurance discounts now. This is actually something that um, is trying to be introduced into some legislation. Uh, in other words, um, we'll discount your insurance now uh, if when your house gets flooded, you promise to take a buyout. A lot, most people said they were willing to take that deal. So that's, that's a potential policy uh, tool for the future. A lot of people would prefer to restore natural wetlands, which I found uh, enlightening <laughs> that people think nature, you know, could take care of a lot of flooding if we just let it uh, take its course and weren't building in, in um, areas. And so a lot of people were in favor of restricting future development in areas that flood. Um, a lot of people were not interested in building more levees, uh, but the vast majority of people said we should definitely maintain the levees that are already in place. About 77%, so this is a pretty good snapshot of the public, are in favor of this buyout program after houses are flooded, far less are likely to support it before the houses are flooded, uh, which is, again, the psychological uh, aspect of, of people really accepting that the risk is real. So, okay, now we'll, we'll support a buyout. So risk perception is heavily financialized in this culture. Remember, Mary Douglas is saying, risk is a cultural construction. And what we find is, is people are really thinking about the risk in financial terms, tax base, home equity, these types of things, and actually not so much about their actual personal safety, which, which is a strange comment on a hyper-capitalist society. But it's also embedded with these, within these ideas of, of moral obligations to your community and what it means to be a neighbor and so on. This is small town uh, Midwest. So people are more likely to move if it's a, a community decision. Um, moving as a community can preserve the tax base and cultural institutions. Uh, and a lot of people couldn't do it on their own. They, they would really only do it as, as a, a, a part of a larger project. But it requires additional funding than just the individual home buyouts. And we don't have a federal program. We only have a couple of pilot programs like Ile des Jeunes Charles. So what's happening on the East Coast, one of the hot spots? <clears throat> I started doing some research in the Chesapeake Bay area with a, with a colleague at Washington College, which is on the eastern shore of Maryland, uh, Aaron Lampman. Uh, and uh, we've been working there for about six years, uh, mostly doing a, a lot of interviews with, with uh, homeowners, business owners, uh, policymakers. The problem there is something called relative sea level rise. Uh, the eastern shore of Maryland is gradually sinking, a tectonic subsidence. Uh, it's it's um, a geological phenomenon that's been happening for about the last 10,000 years since the glaciers retreated and there's a rebound effect. Uh, and so you, you see that the, the ground is actually sinking. Meanwhile, the sea level is rising. So while the ground is sinking and the sea level rising, the relative sea level rise in any one spot is much faster than it is in a lot of other places where it's not sinking. In some places like New England, the land is actually going up a little bit, and so sea level rise isn't as noticeable as, as places like the Chesapeake. Um, so that's a, a, the relative sea level rise is rapid on the eastern shore of, uh, of Maryland. So um, IUCN, International Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, came out with a report uh, where they actually defined this idea of chronic inundation, uh, inundation. How is sea level rise first manifest? higher tides, more frequent higher tides, more frequent abnormal higher tides are what you see sort of on a day-to-day on a -day basis. 
Yes, when storms come through once in a while, they're worse, but it's really this monthly, geez, it's just the tides seem to be getting higher uh, kind of phenomenon. And uh, that's what they define as chronic inundation. Uh, and they've identified 91 communities that are particularly at risk around the country, and 80% of them were in Louisiana and Maryland. And it's expected that this will double uh, within the next 20 years. Here are some pictures I took on the eastern shore of Maryland in a place called Smith Island. Uh, and uh, this is what the town looks like once or twice a month. Uh, it's actually, it's, it's, the tides are just getting higher and higher, uh, more and more common. It used to, they used to have high tides like this. They call them spring tides, king tides, uh, sunny day flooding. Uh, and this used to happen maybe once or twice a year um, because of the moon and this other kind of things, wind directions coinciding with the moon. Uh, but now it's happening. It started happening once a month and now maybe once or twice a month. And this is what people are, are dealing with. And so we went there to try to understand uh, how people are perceptualizing, percep uh, per uh, thinking about risk. So what does it look like uh, on a home-to-home -home basis on this, um, I, I believe it's on your upper left, uh, this house, the picture of the house. Uh, their front yard is essentially turning into a salt marsh. And if you know anything about coastal ecology, there's fiddler crabs running around. Um, and uh, so uh, th this this house is, is um, um, starting to get like water seeping into the basement from hydrostatic, hydrostatic pressure and so on. Something that's really important is here's a business on Smith Island in another photo uh, where people, you know, really can't get uh, to the business uh, several times a, a month. This was a huge problem in, in Annapolis, their downtown area is in this area that's sinking uh, and um, people couldn't get to businesses in downtown uh, Annapolis um, a couple, maybe one Saturday a month or two Saturdays a month. And this was impacting businesses. Uh, and so they put in a huge pumping infrastructure system to deal with it. Structural uh, solution is appropriate in a place like Annapolis, not Smith Island, which would never meet a cost benefit analysis. You start to see weird things like as the salt water gets up and it intrudes, your forests start dying because they can't tolerate uh, salt water. And if you drive around these areas, you'll see all these ghost forests. Uh, and the last picture is just actually the what used to be a road going to a town is now um, inundated a couple of uh, days out of the month. And it it gets it gets uh, pretty personal. Um, this picture of the child in the canoe was actually given to us uh, by a woman we interviewed. Um, and this is the child actually going to school. Uh, her yard is flooded and uh, she can't get to the school bus. And so her mother would put her in a canoe and take her to the school bus stop about uh, once or twice a month. Uh, and so this is what people are having to deal with on, on a local basis. You don't want to be driving school buses or emergency management vehicles through salt water because it corrodes the brakes, the, you know, the ax axles and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, you shouldn't be driving your own car through salt water uh, either. Um, so this is a huge problem that I'll, I'll talk about uh, in just a few minutes. Dorchester County, Maryland is ground zero. Uh, it's expected that 60% of the county will be permanently in inundated within the next 30 years. And this is something that I advocate when we talk about climate change. People stop saying by 2100 because that's kind of abstract. By 2050, even that's like, I don't know what that means within the next 30 years kind of hits home a little bit more uh, because that's actually the life of your typical mortgage. So imagine if you buy a house here with a 30 year mortgage, it's gonna be underwater before you finish paying your mortgage. Uh, that's something uh, that I think is, is a bit more realistic to think about. So after um, Hurricane Sandy, there was a project submitted uh, to buy out homes on Smith Island. Uh, at first, people uh, were interested in doing it, but eventually uh, the county commissioners voted it down. Uh, so those homeowners who wanted the buyouts couldn't get them because the county commission didn't uh, prove it. And the rationale was, if we admit that this is a problem and people start leaving, the tax base will implode and real estate values will implode. Uh, and so a lot of local political leaders either cannot or will not admit that this is a problem. And we start to see these disconnects uh, between federal, state, and local policy. So we interviewed a lot of people, especially on Huppers Island uh, and, and Smith Island. Uh, and uh, here's what we found. Uh, a lot of 
This is a little bit different from the Mississippi case here. People's livelihoods really are based on, on the water uh, and uh, especially commercial fisheries like um, blue crabs uh, and oysters uh, and, um, and tourism is a, is a big uh, draw for, for the local economy. A lot of these people have been here since Captain Smith first settled the island uh, a long time ago. And so uh, they've been here for multiple generations. And so they have a very intense um, identity associated with the, with the local place. You have a lot of youth who are leaving. This is true um, in the Midwest uh, also. Uh, and, and, and interesting, we did some work in Japan I won't talk about now, but uh, rural areas of Japan, coastal areas are also experiencing a lot of youth uh, leaving. So you're left with just older people. And then you have actually retirees who are coming in to buy inexpensive property on, on the coast. Uh, so you have an influx of, of re retirees. So this kind of sets up uh, some of the context. When we talk to people, local people, a lot of them really don't believe in climate change and they don't believe climate change is causing the sea level to rise. Uh, and they talked about this in terms of identity. These are things that other people believe uh, versus people who live here who are hardworking and have been here uh, multiple generations. Uh, and they would engage in some of these discursive strategies like actually saying, well, why are they spending money you know, on people in Baltimore when they should be spending money on people like us who are hardworking uh, people? And so you can see how this risk is being constructed within social identity and group boundaries, uh, which is what Mary Douglas was talking about. A lot of people said their knowledge was more valuable than scientists. I, you know, to a certain, uh, to a certain extent, I, I um, uh, agree with that. Uh, but then when they do line up, it's, it's something that should be paid attention to. Uh, and those people on Smith Island were so stigmatized and victimized, they actually were able to sell their houses and all of them left uh, because they just couldn't bear to live there anymore because they were labeled as traitors to the community. <clears throat> so what do how do the people explain the fact that their front yards are turning into salt marshes? Uh, they say it's because of erosion, uh, and it's true uh, that more wave action from higher sea level will create more erosion, uh, but they're really focusing more on the erosion. And again, they're focusing on this structural bias. Uh, and so this idea that the Army Corps of Engineers is failing us, the government is failing us, they're spending too much money on other people rather than us. Uh, and what we really need is like rip rap around the north end of the island. Uh, and so they latched onto this idea of, of convincing the government, and they did eventually convince the Army Corps of Engineers uh, to spend about two and a half million dollars on a stabilization project, uh, which will help for the short term, but it's not going to uh, really be a long term solution. The other thing that we found really interesting, and I will wrap up in, in just a few minutes, is that you know people when they talked about this idea that they have to deal with this these high tides, really kind of normalized it. Like, well, it's just something you have to deal with, and they have. Um, all kinds of little tricks, like they have a spare car, like they'll go to the mainland and buy a junk car that's worth a couple hundred dollars, and they'll drive that through the salt water on days when the water is high. They call them salt water cars. Uh, but something that's really important is, like Leon Festinger predicted, they really wanted to convince everybody else the problem is erosion. And quite often, they only agreed to do interviews with us because they wanted to convince us so that we could convince policymakers it's erosion, not sea level rise, uh, and we need more erosion management uh, policies put into place. So this idea, of, Fessinger was saying, when you're faced with cognitive dissonance and you can't resolve it, you try to make other people conform uh, to your beliefs. And we have a lot of example that this is a, a captain of one of the boats that ferries that goes back and forth um, from from to, from Tangier Island, which is one of the other islands. And if you can't read it, his T-shirt says, "I refuse to be a climate refugee." Um, and so people are really actively resisting this this label. So again, perceptions of risk are a social process, uh, and um, now you have a pretty big gap between how local people are thinking about things and, and the government is thinking about things. And this is, to me, particularly alarming when we look, when we talk to emergency management agents in these various places. And so in Dorchester County and some of these other counties, um, emergency management agents are telling us there are 
two, maybe three days a month where we cannot get emergency management vehicles to people who need assistance. Uh, and at what point will you simply cut them off? And at what point will the Maryland Department of Transportation say, we're not gonna fix a bridge like this in this picture anymore because it's not gonna be serving any people that can, can live there anymore. Uh, and so what you have right now is people are starting to talk about this, but the way the public thinks about the risk and the way emergency management agents and people like the Department of Transportation are thinking about it are completely disarticulated. Uh, and so as a result of that, very little gets done. <clears throat> so both in the Midwest and in the Chesapeake, everybody wanted to sort of avoid this idea of everybody moving away and maintain, they want to maintain their cultural identity. Uh, risk, even in the Chesapeake, is highly financialized. Uh, people were talking a lot about um, economic impacts, very, very concerned about tax base. That's why the buyout was actually voted down. There's a lot of this delineation of us versus them that helps define risk. Uh, and um, people are, you know, would be more likely to go along with it if it's community-based and you can actually solve a lot of the economic problems of the town by uh, relocating. There appears to be many more successful relocations in the Midwest than on the East Coast. And I'm not going to go in, if you want to ask more about that, I'll go into it, but I'm running out of time. Uh, clearly, we need some leadership, especially at the federal level, um, to, order in, to deal with a lot of this. So in general, the public would support relocation, perhaps managed retreat. We might want to use a different word because retreat admits defeat, but I actually think that would lead to a change in our worldview that we need to live with nature, not be constantly fighting against it. Um, but that's a that's a, a whole nother conversation. Um, we might want to move away from this focus on individual properties. It might re work really well in some places uh, like New York City, but certainly not in more rural areas. We need dedicated funding for infrastructure uh, and um, helping communities envision what they would be like if they moved uh, is something that we clearly uh, took out of the um, a lot of this. And so this is my last slide. Uh, basically, when I put together this idea of cognitive dissonance and the cultural construction of risk, what, is, what I'm seeing is there's a tendency for people to actually not to react to what is clearly important information that they're seeing in front of them. Uh, and with some other authors, I've, I've labeled this ecomyopia, which is this tendency to ignore, recognize, or fail to act on ecological information that contradicts your political arrangements, social norms, or existing world views. Uh, thank you very much to the National Science Foundation and to Lehigh University for a faculty uh, research grant. <laughs> uh, and uh, with that, we'll open it up for questions. Boaz. Great, thank you, David. Um, you know, uh, I, I'll start with with one question uh, kind of haunting me from, from when you, you started discussing uh, the role of the uh, community centers or the church or, you know, the, uh, the, the, the organizations and facilities that kind of build the community uh, around uh, common vision and culture, uh, maybe it's religious, maybe not. So obviously as a university librarian here, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, like what, what type of commitment and uh, what type of, uh, role can uh, libraries or any type of those, you know, kind of the keepers of the tradition uh, play in, in kind of trying to shift that uh, uh, understanding, you know, from, you know, like, what is it, who we are, you know, uh, uh, into like, there is a risk, uh, we need to address it as a community. Uh, what do we do, you know, as you know, <laughs> libraries played a role, a quite significant role when uh, flooded uh, floods happened in various areas uh, in, in, uh, in the US. And uh, I'm curious if if you see a way if your survey covered you know the way that those uh, organizations uh, see themselves as 
leading uh, that uh, uh, movement or uh, kind of depending on their flock <laughs> to kind of, you know, uh, say to them, you know, like, this is what we, we need to do. And kind of even imagine, you know, like I'm thinking if you were able if, uh, as a policy, if we were able to move those center of vision, of vision or of community uh, center together to another place, would it be easier uh, for the whole community to kind of address the the challenges in a in a different manner. So I kind of I, I wondered if you have uh, you know looked into that. Like what what are those uh, uh, organizations and and uh, those uh, kind of centers of identity uh, feel about you know playing a more active role on kind of you know addressing climate change or whatever they call it, you know, <laughs> uh, to, to kind of make sure that there is a good movement forward. Thank you. Yes. Um, in the survey, no, but in interviews and uh, participant observation, you know, spending a lot of time in Valmeyer in particular, uh, the answer is clearly yes. Uh, so I had mentioned uh, schools and churches, uh, and these are core institutions, especially in, in smaller rural areas uh, and in a lot of urban areas, too. Uh, so, uh, I mean, churches in particular, but I didn't really talk about history uh, and museums, uh, which were very important. And so uh, Valmeyer, the only library they had was actually in the in the high school. Um, and, and that was obviously important. Uh, but history was very important. And people talked a lot about the history of the town uh, when they were deliberating relocation and when they were planning the relocation, uh, and in particular, the idea that when the town was first put in the floodplain, it was actually there to be next to a rail. I'm talking about Valmeyer, Illinois. This is this is again, you know, one of the best best examples of of success. Um, the the town was never really there to be next to the river. It's just that a flat place is a good place to put a railroad, and it tends to be flat near rivers. <laughs> so Valmeyer was there to be next to a railroad so that they could put wheat and other grain in in you know onto trains uh, to take it to market and it didn't really need to be there uh for um you know to be next to the river uh there wasn't a lot of commercial fishing um and so on and so knowing that history talking about that history uh made it a little bit easier for them uh, to be able to say well you know historically there is no reason for us to be here this is different in the chesapeake where historically it's every reason you know, not not to leave where they are. Um, so so that's one aspect of how history was important. And of course, all of these documents are at that point, they were in the town hall or the high school and so on. Most of the documentation of the town's history. When they relocated to the new location, they built a museum as a part of the relocation. Uh, they took a little old schoolhouse um, and they moved the whole schoolhouse up onto the hill and they made that their new museum. And in that museum, they document, uh, there were many floods, by the way, previously, uh, like in the 1930s and 1940s and 1950s. So 1993 was really kind of a last straw uh, and they decided to move. And all that is documented now in, in that um, museum and all the documents, uh, historical documents and so on are sort of now in a place that's centralized, and it's a, it's a little bit of a tourist attraction, but it's definitely a community resource. Uh, and so, again, it's this idea that you can use the community identity and use institutions like libraries or museums to actually make the relocation more likely and more successful by maintaining a, a community identity. Yep. Thank you. That's That sounds great. Uh, and, and uh, as usual, you know, we, we, we seek relevancy and, and uh, community uh, support as, as much as possible. Happy to look into that. That's interesting. Uh, so uh, here is a question <laughs> from Joshua Pepper. Uh, should real estate futures be pricing in future climate risk? Uh, if so, why is it uh, vulnerable property still expensive in Miami, for example? Uh, and if not, why is the financial industry not able to do so? That's an excellent question. Um, and and if you can access the slides at some point, I would highly recommend you read the work by Keenan uh, that I had cited in one of the earlier slides. This is exactly what, what he's writing about. Um, and he's calling it underwater writing. 
So essentially, uh, we are we are waiting uh, for the signals to come. At this point in time, local zoning uh, and and um, building permit agencies and so on uh, are are not really restricting a development because as long as you conform to the National Flood Insurance Program uh, requirements, you can get flood insurance and that flood insurance is subsidized. And so at this point, there is no disincentive to building new real estate, expensive real estate, especially in places like Miami. Places that, you know, a model will predict will be, uh, you know, maybe one or two feet underwater within the next 40 years, they're building a very expensive real estate. The issue is, I, the issue is that uh, you know, the insurance is not accurately reflecting uh, the risk. Now, what is going to happen at some point is that the reinsurance industry uh, is going to reevaluate on a massive scale what they're willing to underwrite. Uh, and when, and they do big time climate modeling. Uh, and uh, by the way, here's here's a pitch. We just created a new uh, center um, for uh, catastrophe modeling here at Lehigh under the leadership of, of Paolo Bocchini. Uh, and, and we're going to be doing a lot of that kind of modeling here at Lehigh. But basically, uh, at some point, um, the reinsurance industry is going to send the economic signal to the insurance industries that say we're not going to we're not going to cover you we're not going to underwrite you it's too risky climate change is is the impacts are getting it's not profitable for us to do that at that point you're going you will probably see something that economists are referring to as climate panic uh and you're going to see a massive exodus of of equity from from a lot of these places that are no longer insurable until that happens there are no disincentives, disincentives to continue building in floodplains. And we see them building like crazy Miami. It's like, it, it just, it, it, it boggles the mind. But essentially it's this idea that the free market decision is being corrupted by these discounted insurance premiums. Yep. Hi, <laughs> so kind of related. Uh, Jennifer Jensen is asking, uh, so I lived in a city that has two 100-year floods in five years, uh, kind of predicted, I guess. Uh, it was astounding to see people rebuilding the area that really should not be rebuilt on. Uh, so uh, I think that the, this is really bad issue uh, is really significant, given that people have ties to family, location, and a sense of place. Uh, and uh, you've covered some of that, uh, and you know. But but what 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 can we do? Is there is there something that you know we we want to do? We are able to. Well, the, I think I think bigger waters. Uh, the bigger waters two twenty twelve act it was an attempt to do what should be done, <laughs> which is basically implement uh, the premiums based on the true risk of the flooding. Um, now. It needs to be bundled with some other. You can't just jack up everybody's, uh, uh, you know, uh, flood insurance premiums by by you know a magnitude of ten. Um, so it has to somehow be phased in with incentives to perhaps relocate, take buyouts, and so on uh, and so forth. Uh, and I think that is is sort of that that is the the magic combination uh, that would help. Uh, one or the other alone isn't isn't quite enough to do it uh, because people aren't going to take. The buyouts, as long as they keep, as long as they know they can keep getting cheap flood insurance, um, and uh, and so so the two have to sort of work together. Uh, and again, I'm I, I'm arguing, and a lot of other people are arguing, that this is something that's really going to have to come from the federal level. It's 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 not something that states can do it on their own because the, the federal government runs the national flood insurance program and the FEMA buyout program, uh, and those are the, the two policy tools that have to actually be uh, be ramped up, but. A lot of people um, would relocate uh, if if the economic signals were correct, uh, and they somehow have to be put back in, into line. Uh, and there's, you know, this is this is controversial legislation, but people are introducing you know bills now and then, or trying to sneak language into bills uh, uh, to try to address some of this. Uh, but in a lot of states like Florida, where the coastal real estate drives the economy. That is not popular, uh, and so this is this is the conundrum that we're in: the market versus federal, 
the market versus disarticulated federal policy? Yeah, uh, th there are two questions here about the uh, relocation. Uh, so, you know, like, do, do you have statistics uh, about where is it most successful? Uh, like when we're thinking about uh, the proximity to the former location, is that a factor? Uh, do we think about uh, the, the size of the community, you know, like if we're, I think you were saying the whole community as a whole, when it moves, it is a more successful venture than moving pieces of it, you know, uh, along the way. Um, do you have information about kind of, and maybe even internationally, because you, you, you know, you mentioned Japan, I'm kind of thinking, you know, like, is it a cultural based kind of format where, you know, like in certain countries, you can count on this number and those components. And in other places, it's more complicated. It kind of depends. I'm sure it depends, but <laughs> you know, do, do you have more information about that? those attempts, the way that it kind of worked out? Yes, uh, I haven't, but other people have crunched those numbers. Um, that, that's basically FEMA data. Uh, and um, Ciders and, and some other people, uh, um, AR Ciders and some other people have have, have published on that. Uh, basically, it does tend to be more successful in areas where the real estate is less expensive and you have more space. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, and so, yes, most of your, your you see more successful buyout programs in the Midwest than you do on the East Coast. Uh, and um, so, for example, uh, you know, this, this, this town that that relocated, uh, Valmeyer, uh, Pattonsburg, um, and some of the other ones. And, 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 and incidentally, my colleagues and I were involved in a huge project where we were actually trying to relocate a town <laughs> called Olive Branch, Illinois. Um, and it fell through almost at the last minute. Uh, well, yeah, it fell through, but quite far along in the process. Um, it was a small town of 500 people. Um, but, um, the deal out in the Midwest is they're more trapped in this property value kind of situation because you have economic problems in the Midwest where you have farm consolidation. And so we used to have, you know, 40 farms. Now you have one. Uh, so the downtown has disappeared because you don't have mechanics, barbershops, hair salons, whatever, uh, you know, restaurants. And so you have this out migration from from rural areas. Uh, so you have economic problems to start with. Uh, and so people become trapped, like their houses, like who's going to buy a house in, you know, in a rural area where there's no job opportunities or anything like that. Uh, and I should point out Valmeyer is within commuting distance of St. Louis. Uh, but um, so, so, so people there are more likely to see this as an economic opportunity. Let me back up. Communities are more likely to see this as an economic opportunity. And so for Valmeyer, it's like, oh, we can go up onto the hill and we can reinvent what we are as a town uh, to be more attractive to people who might commute to St. Louis, you know, from the, you know, this, it's a long commute. But uh, if you, you can imagine a family who wants to, you know, have their children going up in a rural environment, small town with a nice, you know, new school and all this other kind of stuff, they saw this like as an opportunity. Um, and again, this takes vision of local leadership to sell this as an opportunity, not something the government is trying to do to hurt you. Um, and so, so we see the most successful cases in places where there's already economic problems that can be addressed through relocation, where land is less expensive. Valmeyer, they essentially just bought 2,000 acres of a farm. You can't do that in Staten Island. <laughs> Can't just buy, you know. Re and they tried. By the way, they tried to do this after Hurricane Sandy in Staten Island. There was there was a a, a program uh, to buy out a lot of uh, homes that were on 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 the front line in Staten Island. And those people, there's a, a sociologist who did a lot of work on this, Liz Kozlov, fantastic work on this particular case study. The people who wanted to relocate as a community, Staten Islanders, New Yorkers. They wanted to relocate as a community, uh, and they just couldn't. Like there was no place you could buy, you know, property or whatever, and so they ended up all just moving away to different places. But 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 they wanted to, so it's less feasible on the East Coast. The real estate values are higher. The incentives to actually do it, um, you know, are lower uh, in places like New Jersey Shore. Um, New Jersey has, you know, I think it's called Blue Hills, you know, pretty ag aggressive buyout program. It's it's going. It's a little bit sluggish just because. 
you know, again, the the the, the real estate market signals are not are just not you know conducive to it. It's more successful in the Midwest. Thanks, David. Uh, there was a question about uh, the term "managed retreat" uh, and uh, saying that it is politically risky. Uh, uh, that question from uh, Bruce Whitehouse. Thank you. Uh, it suggests a response of a cut and run uh, in the face of defeat. I, I agree. Uh, are policymakers considering alternative terminology? Uh, when the military has to retreat these days, I believe they call it repositioning uh, or such. Uh, so uh, again, you know, if if it is about you know beliefs and perceptions and you know all of that, uh, what other alternatives are, are out there? There have been some other alternatives uh, posed: proactive, um, proactive relocation mostly based on the idea of relocation rather than retreat. Um, again, Bruce, I'll, I'll send you the paper by Liz Kozlov. Uh, uh, and uh, she actually argues for why managed retreat is the best way to talk about this. Uh, and it gets to this issue of acknowledging, like, we can fight nature to a certain point, but there's a point at which um, we need to admit that we're not better or more, you know, we don't have the ability to completely co control nature. And that's actually something good. That's something we should be thinking about. That's something we you know, maybe should be admitting or at least talking about. Um, so, so that's one that, that's one reason. And the other reason is, uh, you know, like if you look at World War II and the history and all this other kind of stuff, retreat was really just a way to regroup and attack again. <laughs> so some people argue it's, you know, from a military perspective, it is not a bad, you know, it's not a bad term. Now, from a local perspective, when it, it's threatening the local tax base, yes. Uh, it is a bad word, uh, and I remember uh, sitting in uh, in a in a folk in a uh, we were interviewing a county emergency management uh, personnel and a, other, a bunch of other people in a county in um, uh, in Maryland, uh, and and we actually asked them, you know, what what do you talk to people about this idea of managed retreat? Uh, and they said we would never ever use that word. <laughs> Are like the county commissioners would fire us uh, because it's admitting that your property values are in jeopardy. Uh, so it's it's one of these these questions of like you know should you use an alternative word? Well, it kind of depends where you are in the policy hierarchy. It's something that you know as a global community we should be having a conversation about. There's some places you know some countries are going to you know suffer more than other countries. Uh, it, but then you get to the local level, and it's and it's a, and it's a different conversation. Uh, but um, yeah, there's been a lot of uh, alternatives proposed. Um, there's been some debate in the literature, but yet I still see managed retreat popping up. You know, in in like uh, you know policy documents and whatever. I, I I'm afraid it might be here to stick. <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe last question. Uh, th there was a. There was a, a, a again kind of a, a curiosity around the uh, office, the, the buildings that build that community or that they mean the community. So churches and the uh, different uh, municipal buildings and uh, all of that. And uh, when the businesses leave, so uh, you know, someone is asking, that means business, <laughs> you know, like what you're saying. You know, uh, I, I am impacted financially. Uh, I know that uh, something uh, uh, seriously uh, is happening. Uh, so I'm kind of start to plan or start to move. So uh, when the businesses, churches and other uh, municipal offices get flooded or, uh, you know, there is a loss of the business, uh, things hopefully or are changing in in people's perception. So um, so you know when do they recognize? Like is is there like is there like any anything uh, you know like that happens suddenly? You know like that panic, <laughs> you know that you you're indicating, or is it like you know is it, at this point it's kind of that gradual? It's very hard to, you know, like kind of pinpoint that this is uh, apparent danger and not something's going to be, you know, like happening in 10 years, 20 years, 50, you know. So this is actually, I'm glad somebody brought up, you know, the, the topic of, of local businesses. Um, 
But again, in the case of Valmire, I'll go there. Uh, so it flooded multiple times. Uh, and so 1993 was just the straw that broke the camel's back. It, it, so we're just we're not, not going to keep doing this. Um, and so it, it was gradual in that respect. But then there was an ultimate trigger. But again, the ultimate trigger for relocation was the knowledge that there was not going to be a structural solution. They were not, the Army Corps of Engineers was not going to build a 500 year levy. It just did not meet benefit cost analyses. Uh, and so, and so there was no alternative. And so then that's when they got serious. Now, in the case of Valmeyer, um, the mayor was desperate to maintain local businesses and get businesses to relocate. What, ha what tends to happen is your smaller businesses, they just can't make it. Uh, and and this is true of, of just about any disaster. And so a disaster comes through, it wipes out a business. Uh, there's there is federal assistant loans, uh, you know, for, for 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 disasters as 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 a result of national national disaster declarations. It makes all kinds of financing and loans available for small businesses, but they can't wait to reopen very long. They don't. They just don't have enough capital um, to 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 wait three four months to reopen. That's it. They're out of business. Uh, and so they tend to leave after a disaster. Your slightly larger business, and so in Val Valmeyer, they actually had a um, a, a printing business uh, that employed like I, I, almost a hundred people. They were actually they went first. They said we are going to go first. We're going to build a new uh, facility at the top of the hill. You guys come with us. So it was actually partially the business that drove. The, the realization of the community that, yeah, we could do this because our major employer is, is going to do it. So we're in. Uh, none of the local businesses made it. The, the little grocery stores, you know, the barber shops, they, they just could, they couldn't do it. With two exceptions, the bar <laughs> did reopen. Uh, and, and it's it's quite fun to go get uh, really, really uh, unhealthy food there. Uh, and um, uh there was another business that I can't remember what it is, but they even lost the bank. Um, they just uh, went away. But all three churches relocated. And, and in the case of the churches, they were actually, they didn't really talk to each other very much. But when they started to talk about what they could be like in the new town, they realized they could all share a parking lot. And so in the middle of Valbire, there's one big parking lot and there's three churches all around it. And so they all you know, we're able to like find a, a, you know, a way to address common needs. So now there's only like, they can share the cost of maintaining the parking lot and stuff. Uh, so um, yeah, it's, 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 it's variable. Uh, these things, you know, some, there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers, unfortunately. And small businesses tend to be the ones that find the most difficulty adapting. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, it was so interesting. Uh, what we're gonna do is to uh, first, as as everybody I think know, uh, we record this session and it's gonna be available mm -hmm. on the LTS Talk site, so you can see it again uh, and check references and all of that. We're also gonna ask for uh, some, uh, you know, account of the references already mentioned uh, during the talk today. So we're going to offer them as well because uh, many of the uh, books mentioned are available uh, through our libraries. So that that's wonderful. Uh, and uh, it was kind of uh, closing the circle today uh, because if you remember last year, a theme was miscommunication, uh, disinformation, misinformation, uh, all those things. And we talked about uh, that today, thinking about the climate change as well and the way that we can uh, make a difference as, as we're trying to kind of plan ahead and finding uh, better solutions to the communities around us. Maybe libraries can play a role. <laughs> uh, that can be really, really uh, interesting to look at. So uh, so thanks again, uh, David. It was, it was fun uh, and, and good to, to hear you talk about what you're working on. And, uh, and we'll... Uh, uh see hopefully more of you and you <laughs> again even next time uh, in the next talk that we're gonna have in april may we're gonna send a message to everybody so uh thanks again and have a good evening uh and uh bye for now bye mom <laughs>